Hello, everybody. My name is Ari. And you are listening to Bass Tunes on KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine. Today, finally got another band interview, and we got Zane here, the, let's make sure we got this all right, singer, songwriter, main guitarist for the band Thanks Light. And they recently just put out, or in 2024, I don't think it was exactly right now. It's like in January. So I think it was in January. But headphone problem again. If this keeps happening, I'm just going to deal with it. These loner headphones are falling off. You know what? It's fine. We'll deal with it. It's fine. If anyone sees it, it looks funny. All right. Say hi, Zane. How you doing? Doing all right. Great. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, so let's read a little bit about the band. I like to go off the band's Spotify descriptions because I use Spotify. And it makes me think, what is the band putting out there for themselves? What is their sort of mission statement? What is one of the first impressions? Because I don't know how many people actually use that kind of stuff, actually scroll down. But I'm always just like, oh, what's all the little information? So, gothic country, roadhouse rock, psych folk, grown under a moon tower deep in the heart of Texas. And I'll ask a little bit about that. Their first album was in 2007, which I was very surprised at. I was like, wow, 2007. And their latest is Wildcatting in the year 2024. Were you guys like on tour in LA or what was going on with that? Uh, for, the 20, for the 2024 record? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, it was something about you being in the area. I'm yeah, there yeah. I, you know, my uncle lives in LA uh, in Culver City. And so I, you know, always have a room to crash in. And so I've just kind of made it a habit to come out here and spend some time in L.A. and play some shows. I have a lot of friends out here as well, so it's really easy to get things going. And um, I love spending time in L.A., so um, it's just kind of a good excuse to get out to California and play in different venues with different bands and just have a different scene altogether. Um, So that's something I just kind of do regularly, um, trying to do it annually, I would say. Well, that's awesome. My first question for you. When did Thanks Like get started and how was it formed? Um, so initially, years ago when I was in high school, it was my solo project. Oh, okay. And I put out a record and then I went and formed, I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Oh, UC from, Austin, shout out. Yep, it's a great place. And I met a bunch of great other musicians there and we formed another band uh, called Cactus Peach. Oh, okay. And so that was a thing for a minute. And then after that fell apart, I was kind of like, well, I want to keep playing music, and I really liked the name of my solo project, and uh, so I just kind of started a band using my solo project name and recruited some of the members from Cactus Peach to fill in the different spots, and I feel like we've been active as a full band since 2013. So, 2013. That so 11 sense. years. <laughs> That's a long time. It is. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense. If it's your personal project, yeah. you can do a lot with it. And that made sense in terms of you guys getting formed as like a full band in 2013 because I was wondering about the big gap between the 2007 project and then the next one in 2014. I was like, I wonder what happened in that time. And honestly, I was thinking – probably like another band or something it didn't really matter it mm-hmm. wasn't like the most important thing what it was it's just a little bit of curiosity a little yeah. little layover yeah a little layover a little quick little vacay <laughs> and then back to the real one back to the real music <laughs> uh describe thanks lights music what is roadhouse rock i couldn't find that as a genre but i did under i understood it that's the that's the cool thing about it the the sort of sub genres that sort of described it when I heard the music, it really did make sense to me. It's sort of a blend of, I guess, more folksy tunes mixed with a bit of, I don't know, psychedelic sort of etherealness to the whole thing, depending on what kind of song and what project it's on. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've always kind of been eclectic as a group over the years, and a lot of it is just that I don't like to stay still, and I'm always trying to figure out the next thing that excites me. Um, you know, the first couple of records we put out, I would, you know, say are more kind of like bedroom rock, you know, similar to like the microphones or Mount Erie yeah. kind of stuff. Or or if you know the um, the Elephant Six Collective, Olivia Trimmer Control, um, heard of the early of Montreal kind of stuff. I was really inspired by that. All right. And then um, as it kind of progressed, you know, I was really getting into Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana. Oh yeah. And so we went through like a kind of like a grunge phase I would say, and I was really getting into this, like Steve Albini and just like oh, how I he produced Steve stuff. Albini. Oh, he's he's the man. He's the goat. RP. And I know, oh, goodness, yeah. um, that was a loss. Uh, yeah. And um, and then, 
you know, I really, and probably in my uh, early 20s, I really got into, you know, I was kind of always, always a punker, you know, yeah. and in my early 20s, uh, I really got into outlaw country. Oh. And I always loved country, but I really wanted to like start writing more of it. And, you know, being from South Texas, you know, yeah. it, it's inescapable. And of course, it's a big, it's a big part of the fabric down there and a big part of the history in Austin, you know, with Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Jerry Jeff Walker, all those guys. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, our music kind of ended up you know, as it is. It's just a, it's a blend of just all these things I love. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, so rock, blues, country, full psych rock. It all kind of goes into this melting pot and you end up with our band. Um, so, you know, what I've tried to do is take a step back and really group all these songs together to where they have like a more cohesive uh, you know, correlation to each other within each record. Yeah. So you kind of it's you're gonna get a little bit of a different sound between each record, mm -hmm. but you know, with each within each record, it's kind of you know its own little microcosm of a sound within that time and place. That makes sense. It did seem very varied, but sort of with a consistent through line, of I guess just sort of folksy and just sort of goes off in a bunch of directions, which I appreciate as somebody who goes off in a bunch of directions all the time with whatever I'm listening to <laughs> or reading about. It's like you know, one day you're just like, I want to do this. And the other day it's like, no, this is the most important thing in the world ever. <laughs> and you never really. And then eventually, I, I don't know if you felt this, but to me, eventually over time, you sort of it all sort of solidifies a little bit into like this is sort of the through line. This is the core part of whatever I'm doing that I'm interested in that sort of stays more s the same. And you sort of find like this is the thing I really want to do. And you sort of go for it. A absolutely, I'd say I'd say our sound has kind of been crystallizing uh, for like ten years. Honestly, I think we finally hit this point where I feel like we make something unique sounding that's like true to us, but it's really it really pulls from all of our different favorite genres and bands. And I mean, and you might you know I'm sure you've noticed this too, but a, a lot of our recordings it's. You know, we're typically using like retro, you know, retro, but, you know, not, you know, a Moog if we are using any kind of synth, you know, which yeah. is an old kind of analog synth or, yeah. you know, rarely, rarely are we kind of incorporating stuff past like, you know, 1980. A lot of our sound, you know, we're using a, a lot of mostly analog gear. We record a reel to reel tape, which is what they used to do back in the day yeah. um, to kind of give it that saturated uh, retro vibe. Yeah, very warm. Um, and it also, if you record a tape, it, it kind of changes the way that you end up creating the song. And I end, I think that it tends to have more of a live, raw edge to it when you do that. So I, I like that aspect of it as well. But hmm. it's kind of almost like bringing my favorite things from the 60s and the 70s and kind of trying to make a more modern take on it yeah, um, while just sense. kind of stealing all the different parts from these different genres that um, I love and I'm trying to make my own thing. And I feel like at its core, that's kind of as artists what we're all trying to do, right? Is exactly. Just trying to make something that we love that represents us. Um, Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Truly. You just take that and take everything you love. What is your musical background over the years? How did you get into playing music? Um, well, you know, in you know uh, Texas, it's like songwriting and s singing songs around a campfire is kind of something that people do, and oh, really? I'm sure they do that everywhere. But I just when I where I grew up, it was very common to pass a guitar around a circle, and if you could play, play something. Oh, that's cool. Um, one of my best friends' dads is a really good songwriter. Oh yeah. And he's a really just fun, loving guy. And they had a, a music room in their house, and um, you know you have, you're a lot more likely to hang on to an instrument and keep playing it if you have somebody to play with. Exactly. And you know, me and my best friend picked up a guitar at the same time. We started a, a little just garage band, and his dad would pop in and, oh, that was good, boys. You know, all right. <laughs> you know, y'all know about this chord, or y'all know what a bridge is, or and he kind of just you know impart little pieces of wisdom on us. And exactly. Slowly over time, you know, we learned how to write songs, and he, you know, we I'd show him and. Um, you know, and that's really kind of got how I got my foot in the door. And I'd say originally I was I was a songwriter more than anything. And you'd say that you were a songwriter over like, over a, a composer or you know, mm. and you know, I, there there's a fine line between a songwriter and a composer. But I think for me it's like the the lyrics and the melody. Um, you know, they all kind of need to coalesce. Whereas a composer, you might say there isn't uh, there might in some instances not be a uh, poetry or words sure. involved it's all music um and i'm not classically trained either everything i've learned has been through you know guitar lessons or 
self-taught uh, over the internet. Um, That's so all you really need. Yeah. I always like to ask this question because it's interesting to see because it, it gives a good background as to like not just musically, but a lot of the time it ends up being where an artist comes from in a lot of ways. Like you spoke about your fam, like the the culture of where you grew up and everybody having music as a background, mm-hmm. as a sort of common thread. And that's interesting. I, I don't really, I, I can't remember, recall if that really happened with us. I mean, I don't know, my family, I think my, my family had some acoustic guitar, but <laughs> they weren't the most musically inclined, but I don't know. Let's see here. Yeah, uh, it, uh, yeah and, and I think, you know, a lot of it depends on, I mean, my mom and dad are not musical at oh, all. Oh, yeah. And, you know, my uncle is, he's a musician, um, but, you know, I think a lot of it is definitely it's, you know, it's nature and nurture, right? Exactly. Like I always want, I always loved music. I always was singing as a little kid. Um, mm-hmm. And luckily there was somebody in, you know, my adjacent family um, that was there to kind of show me the ropes on like how to write a song because I feel like it's still this like weird elusive thing that people have a hard time grasping. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of nebulous and there's not like a, you know, how to write a song for dummies. Maybe there is, I don't know. I haven't looked, but. Maybe there's some tidbits of wisdom in there. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. What have yeah. you learned for songwriting? Because it's when you say songwriting, do you just mean like the structure of the song, or I assume more so the whole cohesive package? Because you said music and lyrics and all that sort of coalescing into one. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Willie Nelson, I believe, said it's you know three chords and the truth. Hmm. And I love that, <laughs> yeah. um, just because, you know the. Is, you know, look at Free Falling by Tom Petty, right? I love yeah. that song. It's three chords, the That's whole thing. Need. Three chords over and over again. Great song. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it is that if you can channel something worth worthwhile that's worth sharing, I think that's like, it's almost like, uh, it's almost like the message more than the medium. Yeah, that makes is sense. Is the most important thing and like whatever emotion you're able to bring into it or whatever kind of piece of life that you can impart into it because that's really that's really what like a song is right yeah it's like reaching out to the void finding somebody and then you might be able to relate to what this person went through and mm-hmm. so it's like oh i'm not alone this person felt this way too that that's pretty cool the best music can really make you either feel for the person like understand where they're coming from or relate to them it just depends on the circumstance are, would you say the lyrics then, would you say they come from a pretty personal place from your music or is the music all coming from like that or is it more so just like a, I don't know, mix of, I don't know, fiction? I don't know. Uh, what would you say? You know, so I, I went to I went to the University of Texas and I, I studied radio, television, and film. Oh, awesome. And um, which is, you know, why I ended up making all of our music videos is because I have yeah, that background. That. Um, originally, I wanted to learn audio engineering, but I don't think UT was very interested in teaching audio engineering. Oh, yeah. um, so that's where I kind of self-taught myself that. But when I was uh, earlier in my writing, I kind of wrote I wrote stories. I wrote like three act structures. Oh. Um, and then, you know, kind of later on, you know, in the last like 10 years, <laughs> um, I wrote stuff that was like a lot more personable. And now I'm kind of starting to incorporate the two things where like I want truth, but I also want like character development within it. Yeah, that makes um, sense. And, you know, like. Uh, the first thing I think of is Poncho and Lefty by uh, Willie Nelson. Oh, I mean, Towns Van Zandt wrote it. Willie made it famous. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it has a whole, it's a very emotional, you know, it's got this whole arc. It's about these two gunfighters. One one kills the other and then flees. flees. And, you know, you get this whole story within, you know, three and a half minutes. Um, and it's very dramatic. And, um, and I don't know if Towns Van Zandt knew a gunfighter or anything like that, um, you know, that's probably not the best example for the truth, but in terms of uh, a story, I think that's a great example. Art is a collection of stories. It just depends on, would you consider uh, the musical process for Thanks Light? Would you consider, what's the process like? Is it pretty structured? Is it more jammy? What do you think? Oh, um, so usually what what will happen is I'll write a song and I have uh, some bandmates that I work with. They're kind of like, they're my, my team, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're all buds and we've worked together for a while. And so I'll usually demo out the song and I'll bring it to him. And one guy, one guy in particular I've worked with ever since my days in college named Michael Frells, um, he'll sometimes help me arrange stuff or sometimes he'll be like, you know, this really needs like this. And so oh, yeah, there I have been some instances from. where he's come in and changed some things around and really improved it. And he went to the School of Music at UT. Oh, so we okay. kind of bring we bring these two different sides of the whole thing together. 
And then, um, you know, our bassist will come in and, you know, he'll he'll learn the original bass line and then he'll improve upon it. And yeah. our drummer will do that and our guitarist will do that. And then and then we'll, we'll kind of jam these songs out, kind of really get them locked in together, and then we'll live feed them onto tape. Oh, that makes sense. Um, that's what we've done recently. But I kind of like to change the approach sometimes, too. Um, mm. Sometimes I'll record the song and send it out to my bandmates and then they'll come in and they'll write something and re- they'll just record it on the computer and that's how we'll do it. Um, and, you know, you'll often get a totally different result um, than the different way you take that process. And um, sometimes it can be good or bad. And so it's a matter of like knowing what songs are going to kind of do better with a different results or a different oh, yeah, process rather. Yeah, I get you. Um, I totally forgot what I was about to say. Give me, a, give me one moment. Sure. Do you play all the uh, instruments on, let's say, your demos generally? Or yeah, yeah. I so I, I can play. I can. I would say I'm pretty. I'm pretty good at uh, drums and bass and guitar. Awesome. And then I sing. Um, yeah. And um, I play lap steel as well. I'm. I can play a keyboard, but I can't really play the piano. Once you add, you know, more than one note, that's when it kind of starts to fall apart for me. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll usually kind of demo all those things get some just rough ideas, just kind of barf it all out there. And then I'll send it to them and be like, all right, make this better. And they, and you know, yeah, it's a they always do. Process. Yeah. And you know, we'll all kind of sit down and workshop it with each other um, and kind of help improve the part. And then once we kind of feel like it's in a good place and we go and record it. Um, and mm. that's, that's that usually. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you guys, uh, so you guys just record the whole thing, at least as of recent, do you guys record the whole thing like live together as a one unit, like straight to tape. Once it's all, once it's all demoed and refined on and rearranged, and you guys rehearse it enough times, where it's like we got this on bag. This is the one we want to do. Yep. It's just straight to tape, no overdubbing, no nothing really. Typically not. I mean, I like to try and do it all in one take, like uh, just because sometimes we'll like punch in um, yeah. after we've done it. If like, oh, the bass is like, oh man, I missed that one note. Can we go through this one section? We'll just punch we'll that just one punch note in. in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, or you know, punch a section in or something like that. But usually, we'll I'll try. We'll just try and one take it. And mm-hmm. you know, I think it's a testament to the to our band. And you know, we're all I think we're all great musicians and work really hard to become great musicians because yeah. it's it's a lot of it's hard, just hard work it and does, practice. It just takes practice. All right. Um, there's no real secret. It's just you got to put in the got to put in the hours. Yeah. Um, and so there's not a lot of overdubbing I, I mean and the thing is is we'll we'll do kind of like a live feed and then we'll kind of go back and add bells and whistles like oh this little section needs like a this little this synth here or this needs a harmony here that wasn't you know we weren't working on when we were in the garage so to speak oh yeah i gotcha um and then we'll kind of all sit back okay this is this is done you know it sounds this sounds filled out this is ready to go and then we'll you know go live with it and sometimes you know you know we'll record it live and then we'll add some harmonies and then the guitarists and the bassists will go and sing those new harmonies and we play it live again. So we kind of had to figure it out after the fact. Oh, almost. so you guys will do another take with that all in? Well, we'll, we'll live take it all after we've kind of gotten the instrumentation and then we might like figure out something after we recorded it yeah. that, that we'll start, you know, it's in the recording now. And so when we go play in live, we want to kind of recreate what we've put into the recording. Oh, oh, when you play it live for people. Or Got it. You, I thought you meant like when you, you like go back in and like do it live again with every, like live to tape. Oh, God. That'd yeah, be a lot. If you that'd be a that. lot. That'd be a lot. So sure. I don't know how much tape costs, but I assume that's a bit. <laughs> it's a... I mean, I don't know how much reel-to-reel tape they really make nowadays. They, there's like one company, ATR, and I think a, a, basically a, a reel of a two-inch two inch uh tape i think is like 250 dollars wow and how much recording time does that get you uh 45 minutes oh my but wow. what so what we're doing though is we'll say we're recording two songs in the studio that day we'll go in and we'll do like four takes of each of them each yeah. of those songs and then we'll go into the listening room and We'll sit there in front of the mixer and we'll listen to it and be like, oh take number three for this song and then take number four that's the one and so we'll be like all right and then what we call we it's called a dump so what you do is you take it from the tape and you send it into the computer. Oh, okay. So you rip and it so, out to the computer. Yeah. And so usually dog. studios are re-recording over old sessions and oh, stuff okay. like that. Okay, that makes sense. I, I used to do it to where we have done a record where we record it all into tape and I still have that reel reel and I can go put it on a machine and pull it up and listen to that, um, which That's is really cool. Um, but 
normally most of our stuff lives in a hard drive after uh, we've recorded it. Yeah, I was wondering because I was wondering if you guys were to master it analog or just master it and like mix it all uh, digitally once that's all said and done. Because it can be, I, I legitimately have no idea how you're supposed to master and mix audio when it was on reel to reel tape. I'm sure it's not as complicated as I might think it is because they had to get it done, right? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately in this day and age, eventually it's gonna hit a computer, yeah. right? So it's like, even if I record all the tape and then master the tape, I still have to upload it to Spotify, so it's still gonna hit a computer. It's still gonna be compressed, it's still gonna be digitally processed right. to an extent. Exactly, so you just, like once you kind of accept that, the thing is, is like back in the day, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. You record everything to an eight, you, uh, you say you're using an, an eight track, okay? You record everything to the band to an eight track. Then you mix that eight track down to a stereo track, which yeah. is two, right? Yeah. Then that stereo track gets cut onto a lathe, and then that lathe turns gets turned into a record. So, you know, back in the day, you wouldn't even hit a computer. Yeah, of course. It's all, it's all physical to right. an extent. And so, you know, with this, though, eventually it's somewhere along, you know, it's hitting the computer. So... Typically what we do is I will we'll live take everything, bass and drums really. I really want the bass and drums to have that analog, like, you know. That sort of punch. Sonic, yeah, that texture to it. Mm-hmm. Then we'll dump it into computer. Sometimes we'll overdub in the computer uh, over the analog stuff. Um, and then usually I'll take it back to my studio and we'll finish a lot of it there. Um, I'll usually sing vocals there because vocals are just, oh, vocals are... They're sometimes tough to pin down. Sometimes you get it on the first try. Sometimes you have to try recording the vocals seven times. And you're like, oh, number seven. That's that's how you sing this part. Yeah. Um, and then once you have it, you have it, you know. Um, but um, eventually, you know, it has to hit the computer. And so usually we'll master, we'll master on the computer. So it's all mastered digitally, generally. Yeah, I think, I don't think we've ever mastered uh, analog. Hmm. Do you do that yourself, or do you no. send it out to somebody? I the thing is, is I'm too close to it. Um, that makes at sense. that point. That makes sense. You know, I've been I've been listening to it for months at that point, yeah. or weeks, or whatever, and so and I, it's too precious, right? I yeah. get too precious about it. I need somebody who has like no emotion mixing my music. So usually, what I'll do is I, um, I'll I'll mix it, get the mix kind of where I want it, and then I'll hand it over. One of my one of my best buds is uh he's an is an audio engineer. All right, and so. And I trust his ear, and I trust like the way he like, puts levels and stuff of certain songs, and we like the same preferences. Oh, yeah. And so typically I'll take it to him to mix it, and then I'll take it to another friend to master it. But my other friend is kind of on hiatus from engineering. Oh, man. So my buddy who's going to mix it is probably going to start mastering as well, because he's he can also master great as oh, well. Oh, well, might yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting having a fresh set of ears to do it, because you think like you... Cause like, oh, this is perfect the way it is. Do you do you think that like you just want somebody else to think maybe it should sound like this instead of this to sort of give a second opinion, or mm-hmm. do you just think that you can't really like, in good, I don't know if you have like too much of an attachment to it to like fully uh, make it to where you think you want it. Would it just take too long if you were to just, like sort of? I, be I like, think I, don't I know think it's I'm both. Doing. I think you nailed it. Um, I think the thing is is like uh, I want a fresh set of ears on it. Sure. I, and the thing is, I'm a big I'm a big fan of collaboration. Yeah. Um, I think it, it takes a lot more work to get somebody to collaborate with you, but I think ultimately you end up with a better piece of art. I agree. At least with music. Um, and so it's like, eventually I'm going to share this with the world, right? Yeah. So I kind of like, I don't want to just like be in my own little corner mixing and mastering and then just like set it to go without like running it by somebody to be like, ah, dude, I don't know, this thing needs to go down or uh, maybe this isn't, you know, maybe this doesn't have enough drive because the bass is too low in the mix. Hmm. So it's kind of getting just a second set of ears and then also somebody, again, who's just not precious with it. You know, when I when I listen to those songs, I, I see the, the people behind the parts. I see I see everything. Whereas with, you know, somebody else, they're not thinking about that. No, they're not. And they're, they're just looking at it in a much more objective way. And that's really what I want is somebody with good preferences to look at it in a much more objective manner. Somebody that you trust and that you know totally. isn't, exactly who, isn't exactly you, mm-hmm. but sort of in the same ballpark for mm-hmm. what you're going for. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's a really interesting insight. I don't think I've heard. I don't think I've uh, spoken to somebody who's like on, like, that much into the process. You know, <laughs> it seems that you're pretty like doing doing a lot of it and end up having a lot of hands in the pies. And I can respect that. Doing it all, man. <laughs> it's the age of doing it all. It really is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, topic change, real quick. Sure. How's Texas like? You've been there all your life. I grew up in San Antonio. Uh, moved to Austin, and I've lived in Austin for 18 years. So I have been there my whole life. Um, awesome is interesting. 
Yeah, Austin's changed so much since I've been there. Um, oh, yeah, you were there before. Yeah. it's It felt like it cha- Yeah, it used to just be like the weird town. Keep Austin weird or whatever, right? Yeah, it's now it's keep Austin corporate. Yeah. Um, it's totally different place. I, I mean, I work in tech for my day job. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, I was working from a laptop in my uncle's living room, um, you know, a couple days ago. So I didn't miss too much work. But, you know, now I took off because they have all their yeah, policies. And, yeah. But uh, outside of that, you know, Austin Austin still has some really cool stuff to offer. I mean, it's still one of my favorite cities in America. Um, lots of just really cool, vibey people. Like, yeah, there's, you know, you have all the tech bros running around oh, now. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. With sure. Austin and that's just like, that's that that's kind of a bummer. But at the same time, you still have a lot of really cool people, lots of amazing music, lots of cool art. It, yeah. still, has, it still has a vibe. It's not necessarily the old... Texas hippie vibe that it used to be. Yeah. But it still is like very progressive, lots of great entertainment, Mm -hmm. um, just like nice people generally. That's good. Um, Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of, it has a good sense of community too. Like people do try and look out for each other in Austin. And, you know, I've I've only really lived there in my adult life, but it's, it's just a, it's a good, good place to, you know, hang your hat, so to speak. It seems like a nice little spot. And I do agree that when I first, like, heard about Austin, I guess, I don't know, when I was a kid or something reading about it, was that, like, it's the weird one. They got alien. The people talking about aliens. It's, like, weird hippie <laughs> stuff. And then, like, South by Southwest, oh, which was sort of a God. thing. With just a lot of a lot of a live <laughs> entertainment sort of thing. Yeah. It's just interesting seeing that, that, I don't know, just sort of the progression. Like, you're saying the tech bros are running around. Is it that noticeable when you're in there, or is it just, like, the culture there? Well, I mean, I you know, I... I I work in the tech bro culture, so I'm around it a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, man. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you see it, it. You know, what really just vanished was the truly strange. You know, we had um, – there's just – there were so many characters running around Austin when I first moved there. And, and a lot of it was just the city was very affordable, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, when I first moved there, I think rent was like 500 bucks for me, <laughs> just something crazy. I mean, I had a roommate or two, but, like, still. Um, yeah. And you know, now it's not even close to that. No, absolutely not. Um, so it's just like, you could really, you know, you could really just kind of like have a part-time job and like four roommates and like do your weird art stuff. And like, there was still like lots of like warehouse spaces to throw like weird DIY parties and like, just like weird little corners that you could find to do fun and interesting things. And unfortunately, I just feel like those spots have been just gentrified oh, yeah. and all the weirdos have been driven. They've been priced out. You know, yeah. some of my favorite eccentrics, you know, they've moved to San Antonio. They've moved to Lockhart. They moved to Elgin. Um, and so those are, there's the uh, Lockhart and Elgin are surrounding towns. And then San Antonio is not really it's like an hour and 15 away. And San Antonio rips, man. I mean, San Antonio's got a cool art scene. It's got its own vibe entirely it's a very punk and metal town awesome lots of diy art like just like cool vibes very just chill um and not pretentious whatsoever which is a far cry from austin which is uh i i love austin don't get me wrong but it you know it's got it's got sides of it that are uh also just like annoying too. yeah I um, gotcha. so yeah i mean lots there's still tons to do i love it and i don't think i don't think i'll ever move um that's but, cool but it's definitely changed a lot and for some for some parts for the better for some parts for the worse that's so. just how things are to yeah. an extent i don't think i don't think i could ever expect a place to ever remain the same for right. a long time I, there's a lot i mean i'm sure in like austin circumstances it was, some of it was just sort of like slowly encroaching and some some of the changes were slowly encroaching and then some of it just sort of happened quickly like yeah. Did, did a bunch of Californians actually move over to Austin? Is that like really a thing? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and and that's you know, that's I I actually have a couple friends who you know were living in the Bay Area and we became friends. I, I worked in music promotion for a couple of years oh, too. Oh, okay. So that's kind of where I got my toolbox to learn to like set up shows and whatnot. Oh yeah. Um, I worked for this really cool company called Margin Walker Presents, and then the pandemic, unfortunately, they had to fold. Aww. And they restarted, though, as this other really great company called Resound Presents. And oh. I got to help them start that as well. That's sweet. And they grew really huge to where I was working part-time and couldn't take on the responsibilities. So we're still great homies. Um, they're a great group of people. Um, and I still see them a lot. Um, but they just they got they grew really fast, which is great. That's great. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, they're a totally independent promoter. 
Um, you know, there's still a lot of that there. I feel like I just totally got sidetracked. <laughs> no, I love that kind of stuff. I'm the king of getting sidetracked. Yeah, oh man. Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, buddy. Because it's, yeah, like, don't worry about it. If you have me talking, I've been trying to, the, I've, I've tried the hardest I've ever, like, I've tried so hard throughout the course of doing this show to just, when I have somebody on, to not just rattle off whatever bs i'm talking about which i think <laughs> people want to hear it but i'm like they want to hear me for an hour a day they already hear me most times because i don't i normally don't have guests on my show it's literally just like me talking to a wall about some stupid album i heard like two weeks ago and i'm just like <laughs> hey you guys ever played that new uh shooter game oh wow i'm just making <laughs> dumb voices <laughs> but it's it's nice to have like somebody's got like just a lot to say and it's cool to hear it and i can and i and i want to hear it so shout out oh yeah all right let me see here what do we got what are you guys working on? Wait, let me see, actually. What do you do outside of music? We said that you worked in tech. Yeah. Your sort of day job, and I was wondering about that. Yeah. Um, I, I, work that. For, I work for a marketing company. Oh. Um, it's, it's hybrid remote. That's sick. I've been working in that for 12 years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm an, old, I'm an old cat, man. I'm, you know, I'm 37. It's so not old. Come yeah, on, I know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding, but um, you know, I've been I've been doing that for a minute, and um, it's great because it's real flexible. Um, it really allows me the freedom to do stuff like this. Yeah, um, which is you know I you know I took a step back and I was like, what what do I want for my career? And I was like, well, I want to be able to grow and progress, but I also want to be able to still have time to do the things I really love. And yes. you know, I love music. Um, it's really really insanely tough to make money in music. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but it's just so much fun and so rewarding, and it really gets me to meet so many different interesting exactly. characters, you know. So um, it just puts me in these situations where I get to, you know, meet so many interesting people and have yes. crazy different experiences, like being on the radio in California. That's pretty sick. Right? Yeah, that's very sick. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, you know, it, 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 you know, I do it for the kicks. You know, exactly. I do it for kicks. That's good though, because. It's good because a lot of I feel like if you were to make the, the sort of art passion, if you weren't able to make it like if you really were, if you end up trying to make it like your living, like a full time thing for a living, you might end up wanting, you might end up hating it at some point. Now it just depends on the sort of balance of that. Yeah. Right. I'd, I'd say so. I mean, yeah, I'd love to do it for a living, full time, if I could make a good living. But yeah, there, there's a seriousness that comes with it too. It's like suddenly, like oh man, I gotta write a, I gotta write a great song, and it's like you know. I got, you don't just like sit down and decide to write a great song or whatever, you, you know? Just have to do it. Yeah, sure. it's like it's got to be beamed into you, you know, from some other force or something like that. And yeah. so it's I, I always compare songwriting to fishing. Fishing? Yeah. What's the analogy like? Well, you know, it's like a songwriter, you got to kind of be an antenna mm. and you got you to gotta listen to things. And, you know, and if, if like lightning strikes, you have to be ready to you have to be ready to, you know, record it into your phone or grab your guitar and figure it out. And it's similar to fishing. You got to get lines in the water, and you know you don't know. You could just you could go out and throw lines in the water all day, and you reel in dry. Um, but really, it's just a matter of it's it's having the opportunity, and you or you just never know it. And boom, you know, lightning strikes, and you have a fish on, and you got to right then and there. You got to reel it in. You can't reel it in five minutes later. You can't reel it in twenty minutes later. You got to grab that rod and pull in the fish. And there's just a lot of patience involved too. You know that totally makes sense. I 100% understand that. I think I feel the same way, not necessarily with songwriting, because I, I play some music. I play bass guitar just because my friends right. wanted me to get it. I jam. love the bass. I got a <laughs> I got a drum kit finally for my. I turned like I'm a youngin, so I turned 21 last week, and I cool. or like two weeks ago, and I got that. Those are fun. Those are crazy. I don't know how people don't just hit a drum set and think this is the coolest thing ever. It's so much fun, and you can just do it, and you can play rhythms. And all of that. I mean, the you, you don't even like just, you know, it's like learning the guitar is like hard. Sure. And like not sometimes not very fun. Learning the drums is always fun. Yes. You know, it's, it's so always fun because you actually feel and you get a good little work. And like, I feel like I'm I, right. It's, 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 it's been pretty hot out here. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I assume it's sweltering in Texas. <laughs> yes. Like compared. It's I, an inferno. I live in a coastal town. Yeah. Like not like it's it's way hotter here than it is where I am. Right. And it's like. <laughs> And I think I think 80s hot where I live. I like check my my watch. Like, oh, it's 80 degrees here. Oh, it's gotta be sweltering everywhere else. You guys are probably in the hundreds or whatever. Sometimes <laughs> I don't know about Austin necessarily, but y'all be hot. Oh yeah. But 
hundreds. You'd be sweating like crazy. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm so. It's fun to wear jeans. I can't wear jeans during this time of the year. So we're well, wearing jeans now. So what are you doing? Oh, I mean, well, in, in Texas, in California, oh, yeah, in Texas. all day. This I can wear jeans in this weather. Easy. It's so funny to me because this is jeans weather. This is this is my shorts weather. I'm like, I can wear <laughs> shorts and not look like a doofus the entire time walking around like that because I haven't fully accepted the Adam Sandler like swag of just. Just walking around in a bunch of cargo shorts. <laughs> one day, one day that'll I be. Know, that. Adam, you know, he can he can pull off a lot of things. He has like that sort of energy that allows you to do that. It's true. He he just he does not care. It's true. Yeah, I think a lot of it is definitely definitely the the attitude along yeah. with the wardrobe, and being a very successful movie. I know person. that all that I think uh, that, that also helps, that helps a little that, bit, that a little just bit. a little bit. Yeah. With the public appeal and all that, <laughs> tell me more about uh, Enjoy Ears Records and sure. Productions because I was going to ask about that. Yeah, well, for a while I was trying to do mastering of my own, okay. um, and that was Enjoy Ears Productions. But uh, well, I was Enjoy Ears Mastering. Sorry, and, uh, and Enjoy Ears Records is my little record label, and yeah. you know it's kind of like, you know, I learned back in the day that. Uh, uh, Sublime couldn't get anybody to put out their records, and so they made Skunk Records. Make your own label, and then and, someone will put you on a label. And then, label. yeah, and then after they had their first single blow up, then they got absorbed. I forget which record label put out their third one, but I think their first two were self released. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this on my own because the thing is, we're you know we're not like one genre. You know, we're not like that. We can't be put on like the new folk playlist on Spotify. You maybe one song, but then you go to the rest of our catalog and you're like, oh, this little country, this little rock. And you know, a lot of people have tried to steer us away from that over the years. But honestly, mm. I think the older I get, the more I just drive further into being just our weird eclectic selves. Um, and so, yeah, I think that. For the longest time, I never felt like we were going to have a record label home. So I was like, you know what? Uh, screw it. I'm going to make my own record label. And I'm going to put out uh, my friend's music who, to, you know, my friend's music that doesn't have a home. And yeah. we're going we're gonna to make our own little home. Exactly. And um, our, our, our pianist, Michael Frells, uh, two summers ago, I recorded his first LP, which is a, it's a, like just a, a piano uh, solo record. Oh, wow. And he's a classically trained pianist. And, He's amazing, and uh, I just I, I always love just listening to him improv. And I was like, can we just like just record this one day? Just do it. And so we did. He he he's actually a piano salesman and a music teacher. And so we went um, after hours to his piano store. Yeah. And recorded his record on like a thirty thousand dollars Steinway at like Whoa. you know ten o'clock at night. <laughs> we brought a whole my whole rig out there and wow. And he we did like dollars. different about three different takes of each improvisation and I had him choose his favorite ones and that was the record um, and so he you know instead of trying to shop it around I was I was just like this is getting released on our record label you're just gonna do it yeah what's the process like for putting stuff out on the label like let's say you're you're putting on Spotify do you just go through a different distributor and because there's a lot of digital distributors that people use nowadays mm-hmm. like DistroKid and things like that yeah like again we're doing it all so um, I'm also a visual artist Oh, yeah. um, and so I design our record covers as well. Um, oh, yeah. uh, so what we'll do is, you know, we'll kind of decide on what scale we want to put out the record, right? So like usually for every Thanks Light record, it's like pretty full scale. We'll do CDs, vinyl, oh, wow. and then we'll do a promotional campaign, uh, usually digital. And then sometimes I'll mail out, usually every time I'll mail out a whole bunch of CDs to radio stations. There you go. Um, and then we'll do some digital ads as well with the music video that we make, and and then I'll upload this all through DistroKid, and oh, DistroKid okay. Distro puts Kid. it all yeah it puts it all to the internet for me iTunes, and then it also collects my royalties, which is very helpful. It's great, and then BMI if it gets played on the radio collects our royalties as well. Oh so, wow, okay, yeah, and that just depends on who you sign up with. Uh, as a musician, you can sign um, with a bunch of distributors. Yeah, that's all really crazy to me. Yeah, but, it's a lot. It's been trial and error. Yeah, it's years like, of it. <laughs> I always wondered, like, how how do you put something on streaming services, and you just have to go through a different route. You can't really just put it out yourself unless you have the connections or the. And by putting it out yourself, I mean like not using like a separate distri- digital distributor. Yeah, like you got to go literally through them. put it out yourself because you're putting it out yourself. Yeah, and it still counts, right? Like, it's not like you're like oh. You're still putting it out. Oh, you're, yeah. You're putting all the work in. You're making the art. You're writing up the press releases and all that, I assume, right? You're the one doing – you're <laughs> also writing the press releases. I am. Yeah. Sending it all out. Yeah. It's a man of many hats, and I can really respect that. Thanks. Yeah, man. 
Uh, and Enjoyer's Productions seemed to be a, the website had art, which seemed to be like I don't know what you would call them—the photos of the jellyfish, like the sort of uh, light and dark background. I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot, that's my that's my art portfolio. Enjoy Eyes is the art portfolio. Enjoy. Uh, yeah, that's oh, uh, eyes, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's my art portfolio, and I just needed a place for that to live as well. So I kind of years ago I decided I was like, well, my record label is going to be called Enjoy Ears, and oh, yeah. my visual studio is going to be called Enjoy Eyes. That makes and, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, and and just kind of I just kind of decide what bucket it belongs in, and so you know all of the music videos that I've created are on Enjoy Eyes. And I saw that; those are very interesting. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I always try and try something new, lots of stop animation. I love stop animation because it really allows you to, uh, create something high level on a very low level budget. That makes sense. Um, and that's like, I'm just, you know, again, that's my punk background coming in. You know, there's, there's very, a lot of this is just like, how can I do this myself with, without spending a fortune and make it cool? Yeah. Um, that's really the goal. People you know? can appreciate the effort and sort of scrappiness of it i think that's a very big appeal to a lot of people especially nowadays i feel like a lot of people like my age let's say they still really appreciate the sort of diy thing they appreciate setting up their thing making their own little uh parking lot edm raves that get pulled that get stopped by the (laughs) uci police department because they keep going to the same (laughs) spot every time that hasn't happened in a while good for y'all keep it up kids yeah most of it's uh (laughs) most of it ends up being in los angeles anyways so it's like i mean we don't really have like the scene you guys do man austin's got it austin's got i assume austin's got a big scene but there's everything yeah you know every everybody's Kelly's. got everybody's got their scene you know and each 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 city has multiple scenes and exactly little tiny scenes and huge scenes and you know it's it's kind of funny and and it's all very uh, you know it's a very small world you know so yeah. it's like be nice to each other because I agree, even even from here to austin there's people that know each other and it's just like be good because it'll it will bite you if you in aren't. the butt, if you don't, it'll help do you it. if you are, and it and it will hurt you if you don't. Karma is real. Yeah, just being nice to people and just like and not like just for just to get something out, but just like right, to, just to ha- just so people just, can tell. Just be good. Yeah, and just like be interested in people and yeah. actually want to hear what they're talking about. And I don't know. I feel like it just it help, it helps take you places. Just talk to people. Sure. See what's up. You know, it's to an extent. You know, a lot of cases it's like people people like love a band and they want to support a band because they met this person and this person was so cool and nice and exactly and down to earth and oh and their music's good too. Wow. And oh, you know, they have a friend that's my friend also in this other city and you know, there's it's you know we, you really realize, especially doing this, how uh, small the world is. It really is. Um, yeah. Do you think that the older you've gotten, the more you've realized that? Uh, yeah. You know, I, and, and you know, I feel like I've always kind of felt that way, but I just feel like the more I get out and go to a different place to play a show, there's just, you know, there's we're connected through one degree of separation through somebody else because, yeah. you know, in essence you know we're all music fans right and we all love music and are passionate about it and that's a very actually a surprisingly small group in every city you know that at least people who are as passionate about it at this level right to to go and work on a radio station or go play a a show in another city kind of thing yeah that's just the this is the darndest thing that's the (laughs) darndest thing i tell you what Hmm. yeah Yeah. um so yeah How long have you been doing like videography for? Oh uh, goodness! Uh, pro- since I went to school for it, you know, I honestly, oh, right. um, I music, y- film, and radio. Yeah, radio, ra- 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 television, film at oh, UT is school of communications, and uh, I originally wanted to do it to learn audio engineering because audio is such a huge part of movies. But of and, it, and that it was audio capture was part of it, but audio engineering like music is so different than audio engineering for mm-hmm. a film. Um, and I learned that, you know, I learned how to boom and operate you know devices out in the field and all that good stuff um but yeah you know i started to pick up a camera and i was kind of like okay this could actually kind of maybe help my music thing because now i can learn how to like make music videos yeah you can do that to yourself um and i was like man if i could just like 
you know, learn how to operate a camera and make my music videos, then like I don't have to hire my friends to do it, and I can just do it whenever I want. Yeah, man. Um, and you know that's kind of how the art thing came around too. Is we needed a poster for a show, and you just got so do it. I just I downloaded a free piece of software off the internet that was like Adobe Light, and I learned how to to do Photoshop. Um, you know, and when I went to radio, television, and film school, I learned how to operate a camera, and yeah. then I was taking analog pictures, and I was like, hey, this this might be a pretty cool album cover, you know, and before you know it, I'm just kind of like, you know, this is, uh, I, I think I can do most of this stuff, you know, on my own. And, and it yeah. wasn't like a, I don't need anybody kind of thing. It's just that I, I like to constantly just kind of go at my own pace yeah. and, and I'm, I'm very self-reliant. Mm. And so I really like to just kind of be able to pick up and take on this project whenever I'm able to. Um, but then, you know, also a firm believer in collaboration. So there's like a fine balance in there. Yeah. Do you feel like sometimes uh, doing all that puts a lot on your plate and it feels like it's hard to juggle all of it? Because I feel the same way with yes. all the stuff I do. That's the double-edged sword of it. You yeah. know, it's like it takes me so much longer to put out a record or it takes me so much longer to record a record or finish the album art or any of that because I'm the only one working on major parts of it. You know, yeah. it's like our band will work on all the music and the recordings. And then, but I'm like putting together like the album layout or you know, I'll book the show for the album release party. Oh, um, wow. I'll do the poster for that show. Man. I'll run the digital ads for it. Jeez. And so it's just it's a it's a lot it's a lot on my plate to where I think I have to move at a slower pace, just because uh, I'm doing so much. And I'd yeah. love to I'd love to like be like have somebody who is you know booking shows for me. But uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm just not at that level um, yet. Um, one day. One day. Uh, but you know that'd be it'd be great to have somebody to do that for me. But yeah. I'm, I'm just kind of like, well, if I can't get somebody to do it, I'll do it myself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think I've I've asked this question a couple times, and the answer I've always gotten for like, what is the most, what's the thing you'd want the most out of it? And a lot of it's like someone to do, let's say, marketing or social media or like those sort of like booking things. <sighs> Would you agree with that sort of stuff? Because I think that's what I've heard. Because because <laughs> I've learned a lot about how people have to put all this thing all this time in for social media nowadays social media is a killer it's a creative killer unfortunately yeah i feel I like i made a joke a long time ago that bands are just uh meme accounts with original music content i wholeheartedly agree with that. <laughs> and the smaller and it, ones absolutely yeah and it's like you know and little nas kind of showed us the way right yeah. like he's not signed to anything is any record label that i'm aware of i don't think so we should we fact check me on that one but he he launched he launched himself entirely independently. Oh no, he signed. I, I he thought was, he was. He okay. signed to Columbia. I, oh, okay. I, I thought he was signed. Well, good but for. He good started for, on his own. Yeah. Right, and and, and he I, started on TikTok. Yeah, and he was like a wasn't he like a Nicki Minaj like barber or whatever on Twitter. I don't remember, but mm -hmm. he was some he he knew what it was. He knew what he was doing with this totally. whole social. He's media a marketing thing. genius. He's really good at that. Yeah, he gets everybody. He gets he he'll get like half the country mad. Put up a billboard of it, which I thought I saw that on Twitter. That's the <laughs> funniest thing ever to me. <laughs> oh, he's great. Just like great, amazing. He's so good. He's so he knows how to like he knows how to control like people's emotions on the internet too, and like yeah. get a good reaction out of them. Those are some of my favorite. I mean, and he also makes that. really fun music. Yeah, too. it's fun, catchy pop stuff. Right, it's nice. And, and, you know, I think that a lot of people have seen independent acts blow up, mainly because of TikTok. I mean, oh, TikTok yes. is really the ticket now. It really is. And that's um, the scary thing. Yeah. It's, it's in the, I'm just so, I'm so averse to like turning the camera on myself and being like, hi guys, I'm, you know, I'm recording at KCI today. It's just, it's so not in my DNA to do that. It's not you. Um, yeah. And it's, and, and it's, in its essence, it's not me. And I have to like ultimately be like, okay, what's true to me? How can I? How do I, can I get myself out there yeah. while just being true to myself? You have to balance it. Right. Because, of course, also, like, if you were to do that, just from talking to you, I would not, I wouldn't see that as you. Right? I wouldn't be like, it's not me. hey, guys, welcome to this. We're talking about this and we're doing this. No. But it's like, hey, we're at KCI. Hey, check, you should check us out sometime. Just like, sort of like a casual, like, a, hey, sure. we're doing this. Check it out if you're interested. Very, like, not so, not very, I don't know, over the top energetic in that. It's sort of, and I'm not saying that you're not like an energy. I do have whatever. puppy energy sometimes. You no, I catch do me too. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But it's like, it, it, it would definitely, like, you got to do it in a way that makes you feel, makes it feel real. Right. Makes it feel like you're actually doing it. Because if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? Yeah. If you're doing it all by yourself, if you're yeah. doing all of it and having to figure, like, I, I guess, get, 
learning more that like other people not like learning more but having sometimes being like other people are useful in this regard Mm -hmm. like collaboration is good but you still have like this want and partial need right i think uh, some of it's out of necessity to do it all yourself yeah that why would you want to just like put on a fake front if you're having to do all this stuff anyways right want to do you want to do you if you're already doing you for half of what you're doing musically and whatever right right yeah um you know, it's like, you know, I think about, like, uh, how would you feel if you got on TikTok yeah. and Tom York of Radiohead was like, hi, guys, it's me, Tom York of Radiohead. Come to our show tonight. And it would you, you'd be like, what? I thought someone would have shot him. I, I, thought, mean, I thought that was a clone. I, I thought it would be like Paul McCartney. Oh, it's just like, it, it's like you don't want the mysterious, dark Tom York to be doing that. You want him to be like... You don't hear from him or see him, and then you go to the Radiohead show, and he doesn't say a word, and he just sings the whole time, and he says thank you and gets off the stage. That's what you. That's what you want from Tom York. Those are the fun ones, dude. Yeah. Some concerts are like that. You go to concerts, and they, it's either they just don't say anything, or they're talking a lot. I'm here for either or. Yeah. You know, know. or it's like, uh, you know, Barack Obama tells a story about when Bob Dylan played at the White House, and he said that Bob Dylan did not show up for the meet and greet to meet the president, and then he showed up for a show. Played a show, and then Barack, who was a huge fan apparently, waited around to try and meet Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan had ghosted him. <laughs> so Imagine he just being, and he said he was kind of happy about it. That's so funny. <laughs> he was like, I, I kind of wanted that from Bob Dylan. I know, right? <laughs> I'm like, that's crazy to me. If I was at the White House, I <laughs> right. want to meet the president. Right? He's the president, dude. Like he runs the country. Even if I don't, even if it's not one I I like or vote for, I'm like, he's the president. Bob that's Dylan funny. doesn't care. Bob Dylan does not care. No. Uh, and that's kind of like that's kind of uh, like what we love about Bob Dylan, right? Yeah. He just does his thing. Yeah. And he just go. He gets in, plays the music, gets out. Yeah. And that's all he needs. And that's why he's cool. Exactly. <laughs> Anybody can make their own cool niche like that. You just mm. got to figure out what it is and do yeah. the most to be true to you. Agree. Yeah. And so, yeah, and to answer your question, uh, all day, if I didn't have to worry about promoting myself on social media, I would have so much. And that's that's a huge thing. You know, yeah. it's like that. that's the grassroots movement. Right. And so it's like. If I want people to know about my show, I, I you know I I have to post on social media, like it's it's kind of almost like a necessity now. It is. And so, um, as much as I resent it, it is a it is a part of the musician's DNA now. Yeah. And uh, was never something you know I didn't grow up with social media. You know, yeah, I, social media not. came around and I was like eighteen. So yeah. when I was playing in punk clubs in San Antonio, it's like you'd hand out flyers to your friends at the high school still yeah um and you know i guess that's social media now is this you're just handing out friends flyers to your friends digitally scale, right large scale sort of thing. right um just connected yeah and, and i think that like with all the different platforms kind of demanding that we get this personal face take of it that's just something i'm just it's so like and i think it's against a lot of musicians dna musicians they're they're sensitive a lot people, of them are, yeah. Right? And like this whole, you know, there's like musicians and entertainers. I always think yes. about that way, right? And I entertainers can, can be musicians, but sometimes musicians aren't entertainers. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes um, entertainers aren't musicians either. But you know, it's like, uh, and so it's like these sensitive people who can maybe write incredible songs don't want to just like pay, point the camera at themselves and make a TikTok. Yeah. But like if they want to get their music heard, kind of got to make that TikTok, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to think of creative ways around that uh, that are true to me and get us out there, but not in a way that kind of sacrifices uh, me or my identity or my my dignity. But like, <laughs> you know, it, it is kind of like that. It I would is. just I would just feel weird about exactly. it. I'm not going to lie. It's not and who the, you are. Yeah, and, music is an expression of art. Yeah. It's a personal thing. Yeah. And your music is an expression of yourself and all yeah. your influences and all your passions and everything that you like to do and everything that sort of I don't know, brings you joy to an extent in the world. Totally. And bring it makes you understand, like, this is the human experience and all that, and your human experience. And there's no reason, and you just want to keep it as real as possible. And I respect that, because you got to keep it real. And if you don't keep it real... It's, I don't know, it's, there's so much There's so much fakeness out there. I wholeheartedly there's, agree. Everything is fake now. I would say and so. And so it's like, I'm almost like, just just be real. Just, yes. just kind of be yourself. Don't be be genuine. I think that's an, I think that's another thing that's like just desperately missing is just there's not there's not enough genuine art being made. It's like people are making it as like their side hustle or for clout or like yeah. something. And I think that I'm just kind of like I'm just gonna sit here in my little corner 
and make art that means something to me. And I'm going to try and get it out there as best I can. That's yeah. true to myself and try not to sacrifice too many of my precious ideals and yeah. um, just kind of keep plugging away at that. And, uh, and, and again, doing it for kicks, you know? Yeah. Um, You're doing it because you want to do it, not because you have to. Totally. And it, it makes it so much more fun that way. Yeah, I was thinking that too. It's, it really takes a lot of the pressure off. If I had to make money off of songwriting, I would probably stop writing songs. It'd probably it scare fun. me. It wouldn't be fun anymore. Out of it. Yeah. It's like, sit down and write something that means something to you. It's like, uh, I don't feel like it. And then, you know, um, a lot of times I write a song because I heard something funny and and a melody pops into my head and the thing I heard that was funny seems to work pretty well with that melody and hey that's a hook and there you ooh, go. let's uh, build a verse off of that and yeah and there you go you got a song yeah it's cool to see that you have the f- sort of like this the, the sort of range you have with your work and being able to do your art stuff like that's something i would that's sort of like my dream right because if i were to do something like radio full-time would be sick but it'd be <laughs> extremely challenging probably hard to do so i'm just like okay i'm just gonna focus on like getting my degree in like tech or whatever and get my job and like maybe do this once a week or something and list like having that sort of outlet is so important totally and it's good that you were able to sort of take that and blossom it into something a little bigger scale doing your things i mean you get to go around the world you get not i don't know what the role but you get to <laughs> i don't know i don't know but like, you get have to go I, around have i played internationally i don't think i've ever played in europe that's a goal one day one day hopefully uh, my goal a couple years ago was to play in New York and Nashville. Oh, man. Because I played in L.A. I played in California a lot yeah. because it's just California rips to play shows. Um, I've never – and I went and I did a little tour of the South and played in Nashville. And then I did a fly-in and played a show in New York. Wasn't that awesome? And it was great. Uh, I met so many cool people in both cities. I still keep up with a couple of them. Yeah. I still listen to their bands when they're putting out new music. Um, I, you know, I went through New Orleans as well. Uh, but it's yeah, my time. goal was just like, I need to, I need to try different places. I need to meet different people. Um, I just, I love Austin, but like, you know, when you play in a town like that for God, as long as I've been doing it, which I think is 18 years. That's a lot of time. Yeah. In the same place. Yeah. And it's like, I just, I've played so many of these clubs like 20 times. Where else to go? Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of clubs. And, yeah. and, and the fact that I'm, like, running out of new places to play, I'm like, all right, I need to go try out some new markets. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll play in the surrounding area even. You know, Elgin Why is not? this little cool little town just uh, east of Austin. Shout and out Lockhart. to Elgin residents and Lockhart residents. Yep. Lockhart and Elgin. Shout out. But, yeah, I understand that. That's yeah. really sweet. Mm. So, and slowly, slowly expanding out, you know. Yeah. One day, one day I'll do a, Euro, a solo European tour with a guitar. That sounds That'd be awesome. Sweet. That'd be sweet. That's I'd goals. And I ain't going to Europe in a fat minute, so I'd be lonely just to oh, pop out there. Yeah, same. Great little place. But hey, <laughs> I hope that will happen, and I'm sure it will, if you just keep on trucking, keep on doing your thing. Thank you. Yeah. Where can we find your stuff? Oh, man. We're on the Spotify's, the Bandcamp's. We're on the iTunes's. Um, you know, anywhere, anywhere you can stream music, you can find Thanks Light. That is, thanks for listening, Light My Fire. Oh, that's what it's from. That's what it is. No, no, it's just that oh. it's 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 just you know it's one of those names that it looked really good, and then when I say it, I'll say it to it's. I hate to say it, but it's any anybody who's kind of older. I feel like their just brain shuts down when I say thanks light, and so I have to sit there and say thanks, and then point to a light, and so I you know I've come up with thanks for listening, light my fire, and that's it's a good it one. just comes comes across really easy, so people know what we're saying. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, so, yeah, all over the Internet. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're going to reconfigure our online store here pretty soon. All right. If you go to thankslight.com, we have all of our, yeah. our merch and records for sale there. Also on Bandcamp, they're for sale. And um, we have our last three records are on vinyl. Yeah, you can check those out if you want. And we have a couple left. I think, like, you know, we have uh, we have, like, 30 left of each, something like that. I don't know. I gotta check. All right. Got a box floating around somewhere. So yeah, thankslight.com for <laughs> everything related to the band. Uh, I guess that's where all the social and stuff would be. If you just go, just search up thankslight. Yeah. Three dots on. I think it's a three. Thankslight three dots yeah. on Spotify and things like just, that. Just just type in thankslight and Google. Two words. We own that first page at Google. It's the first. Our thing. SEO. Two. That SE is going crazy. We got it. We got it. Let's go. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Zane, for coming Thanks out. Thanks for having me, Ari. All right. Um, 
we're gonna now hear "Feel My Love" by Thanks Light. Oh, all right, here we go. I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'm going to like re- reset up the shot. So, okay, let me do that. But yeah, uh, thank you all so much for listening. Stay based, everybody. And one more thing. All right, partner. Keep on rolling, baby. You know what time it is. It's Fred Durst Friday. Not today, because we're recording this on Wednesday, but it will be Friday. Now listen to Feel My Love by Thanks Light. Thanks again for coming on. Peace. Can the flowers feel my love? Can the oceans breathe my love? And sing it to the love between me and you. Ooh. Is anybody listening? Does anybody care? They've gone and torn this world apart now. We stay down and stare Can the trees breathe our love? Ooh, can the breeze carry love? Ooh, can the rivers hold it to The love between me and you? listening Does anybody care They've gone and torn this world apart now We won't stay down and stare Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, man. That was Thanks, nice. dude. I was like, wow, I just got a song to. Let's go. <laughs>